All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. I'm really excited that we're here to celebrate the launch of Professor Chris Miller's new book, Chip War, The Fight for the World's Most Critical Technology. Chris is an associate professor of international history here at the Fletcher School. He's written three books before on the history of Russia and its economy. And he's taken a turn towards technology, which is very exciting for me in this latest book, looking at the history of semiconductors and how that history influences technology, economics, national security today. Chris, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for hosting. Let me say how terrified I am to be interrogated by a true expert in things technological. I realized I asked the wrong person to host this conversation. So if you ask any hard questions, please forgive me. I only know about Russian history. Well, let's, let's start there, right? The book starts, and it's one of my favorite parts of it, with a fairly extended history, kind of thinking, going all the way back to World War II, thinking about the origins of the semiconductor, the different people on different continents who are trying to make them. What got you sort of interested in this project, and what are some of the most salient pieces of that history that you think are important for understanding the modern semiconductor landscape? So I, I started this book actually out of Russian history. I wanted to understand why was it that the U.S. and the Soviet Union could both make nuclear weapons in great quantities with great explosive power. Um, the Soviet Union was able to launch the first rocket into space, satellite into space, the first person into space. So the Soviets obviously had really substantial technological capacity in certain spheres. And they had an incredible academic apparatus and produced lots of very smart physicists. And actually, if you dig into who's won Nobel Prizes in physics for semiconductor relevant technologies, a lot of Soviet and Russian scholars had. So this scientific expertise was, uh, was certainly there in any way. It's all published to every country has access to it to some degree. Um, but what the Soviet Union couldn't do was, was miniaturize computing power. Um, and this was surprising. I came to realize because actually this was one of the most important technologies of the Cold War itself. Uh, and there was a demand from the early stages of the Cold War to miniaturize computing to fit on guidance computers for missiles. Uh, and so the, the first chips for semiconductors emerged uh, in the US from the Apollo space program and, and from intercontinental ballistic missile programs. And the Soviet Union simultaneously was trying to do the same thing and just doing it less effectively. Uh, and so I, I, when I began to realize that, I thought, wow, this holds the key to understanding the Cold War, which I thought was Pretty cool. And the more I dug into the history of the industry, it turned out to be a much more global history that stretched from missile technology in the early Cold War all the way up to uh, trends in terms of defense technology, in terms of economics that are shaping the present too. So the book kind of begins and ends by talking a lot about China, but in between you touch on a number of other countries besides the United States. You start by talking a lot about Russia and this idea of trying to copy the US semiconductors. You then talk a lot about Japan and kind of what happens when the Japanese semiconductor industry starts to take off and how the US responds to that. I'm curious, again, coming back to sort of lessons we might learn from history, what do you take away from that US response to Japan? And what might we learn from that in terms of thinking about how the US is responding now to China? So the, so the chip industry grew basically in the United States. There was a small chip sector in the Soviet Union, but it never was able to scale because there was no consumer industry. Um, and so in the US, it, it scaled alongside the rise of Japan economically and technologically in the 50s, 60s, 70s. And by the 70s, Japan was uh, being to be a big player in the production of certain types of chips, memory chips, which were uh, the, the most commonly produced type of chip in, in the 70s all the way up to the present. Uh, and so there's great fear in the 1970s and 80s that Japan was going to overtake the, um, the US ship industry in terms of the number of chips produced and the quality and then uh, R and D, and then control the future of technology. Um, and indeed, there were there were some Japanese politicians, although they were they were not mainstream, but they were meaningful, who uh, wanted to use Japan's chip advantage as a political bargaining chip, uh, threatening, for example, to cut off supplies of Japanese semiconductors to U.S. missile programs, um, and offering not not seriously, but posing the uh, the possibility that the Japanese would offer the same technology to the Soviet Union as a way of pressuring the United States. Uh, and so this was a real challenge, both technologically, but also um, geopolitically. And then today, we don't even think at all about Japan when it comes to chips, although we probably ought to, because Japan's still a pretty big chip maker and produces a lot of the key chemicals and machinery uh, that make chips. It's a small producer uh, in terms of quantity of chips produced, and it's not the leading edge of, of, of logic or memory chips. Um, so what lessons are there to be learned? Well, I think uh, a couple of things stand out. One is that what really made Japan grow in terms of capacity 
uh, of the number of chips produced was an immense campaign of capital investment. So building chips is brutally expensive. It's, it's always been brutally expensive. It's even more so now. Today, a new chip fab costs $20 billion. So it's like the most expensive, not like it is the most expensive factory in the industry. Um, and even then, it was very expensive. And so any government that was willing to pay a lot of money could get a lot of chip making capacity. And that's what Japan did. Um, in the 70s and 80s, and it was driven by lower interest rates in Japan, which facilitated capital investment from the Japanese government, which wanted to prioritize the industry. But and anyone who focused on chip making capacity per se would have missed that that was only part of the question. And that question of who has the best technology uh, is a different question. It's not related to numbers of chips produced. But beyond that, uh, the real important question is not even who's got the best technology. It's sort of hard to know what that means in the abstract, but who's got technology that plugs into a product that everyone wants. And that's what the U.S. was able to do better than anyone else throughout this period. Uh, in the 1980s, that product was the microprocessor, um, which was a fringe product then, but was plugged into a PC, which was a new product in the 1980s, uh, and then took over the world. Uh, and because it was U.S. Fir firms that designed the microprocessors that went in the first IBM PC, they set the standards. And it's the same companies that were producing in the 1980s that are producing it today, uh, many billions of dollars in profit later. And they were able to roll that into their capacity uh, and improve their technology. So I think thinking about markets is actually key um, because unless you've got a massive consumer market, you're not going to be able to make the money that you need to invest in future capacity and future R&D. And Japan didn't think enough in market terms, invested in a type of chip where margins were very low and didn't make actually much money even when they're producing lots and lots and lots of chips. So we've talked some history. Let's talk a little technology. All right. What's a semiconductor? <laughs> a semiconductor, maybe we should start on that. A semiconductor is a, well, it's a class of material. Um, so it's neither a insulator nor a conductor. Uh, and semiconductors are a unique type of material because uh, they uh, change their connectivity based on whether or not an electric field is applied to them. Uh, so you know, glass is an insulator, no matter how much electricity you put in it, it's not gonna conduct. Copper is a, is a conductor, so it's very easy to run electricity through copper. But semiconductors kind of turn on and off like switches if you apply an electric field to the top. Uh, and this has been useful because we have an incredible demand for switches that turn on and off. Uh, and in an iPhone, for example, you buy a new one, it'll have a chip. Uh, and on that chip will be 15 billion transistors. And transistors are just tiny switches turning on and off at a very rapid rate. Um, and that's uh, what semiconductors have made possible. And we're able now to carve these tiny little switches uh, so that each one is smaller than the size of a coronavirus carve them with basically perfect accuracy. Uh, and we do so by the quintillions a year. Um, so the numbers are, are mind boggling. Um, and that's only possible because we're able to use this material to turn on and off the circuit very, very rapidly and produce the ones and zeros that digital computing relies on. And you talk a lot about the supply chain for this and sort of the different crucial companies and, and components in this process. Tell us a little bit about that, sort of what are the choke points you identify that you think are most critical for understanding the geopolitics, the economics of this market? Yeah, well, when, I, when I started this, I sort of thought that tech was something that happened like in the ethereal digital world. It was like in the cloud, somewhere up there. Um, but in fact, it's all about manufacturing. You, you only have computing power because we're able to manufacture transistors at a smaller and smaller and smaller rate every year. Uh, and today, uh, it's only thanks to a, a small number of companies that have this ultra precise machine tooling that we're able to manufacture lots and lots of transistors in your pocket, each one smaller than a coronavirus. And that's, that's a manufacturing challenge unlike any other in human history. Uh, and the supply chain necessary to produce that is the most complicated of any supply chain we rely on today. And it's, it's required the most capital investment of any supply chain we rely on today. It's brutally expensive from the starting point all the way to the end. So what do you need to create a chip? A, you need really specialized software. Laying out 10 billion microscopic, nanoscopic transistors on a small piece of silicon is very complicated. A lot smaller than that. Yeah, smaller, <laughs> smaller. Uh, is, uh, is, is really hard. And so there are three companies that have uh, almost 100% market share in, uh, in designing chips. Um, after that, you need to get the materials to make a chip. So you need silicon that's ultra, ultra pure. And there's a handful of companies that make this. That, that's actually not the hard part, even though it's 99.99999. I think it goes to seven nines, if I recall correctly, after 99 pure. Uh, that's actually relatively easy compared to the rest of the process. Um, then you need all sorts of other uh, chemicals and gases, also very pure, I mean, explosive, hard to deal with. That's, that's manageable. Um, the hard part are the tools. So the way you make a chip is you've got this piece of silicon, you layer very, very smooth layers of materials, different chemicals and, uh, on top of them, each one a couple of atoms thick. 
and you can't have any variation, right? So it has to be the exact right number of atoms thick. And that's, uh, as you might hypothesize, hard to do. Uh, and then you shine a light at it. It's called lithography. You shine a light at it in a specific pattern that's patterned the same way as you want the transistors to be carved out. Uh, and so to do that, um, you need light with a pretty small wavelength because the light that we can see is several hundred nanometers in wavelength uh, wide. So that's too big. That's too big. Uh, we now use wavelength, uh, light with wavelength of 13.5 nanometers is the most cutting edge. So it's extreme ultraviolet light, you can even see it. Um, and that's small enough to carve small enough shapes on the chip in your iPhone, for example. Um, there's one company that makes these machines that can produce this light because producing extreme ultraviolet light is very, very hard. I'm going on a long tangent, this is, this is interesting. Um, so if you wanna produce extreme ultraviolet light, you need to, in this machine, create a, so you have balls of tin that are 30 microns wide, so 30 millionths of a meter wide, falling at a speed of several hundred miles an hour, and you pulverize them with one of the most powerful lasers ever used in piece of commercial equipment, and they explode at a temperature of 400,000 degrees, they create a plasma, and this plasma emits light at the proper wavelength. Then using the, I don't want to joke on this, using the flattest mirrors ever created by humanity, you collect this light because ultraviolet light, it goes through materials, right? Um, so you need special, uh, special types of mirrors that are very, very flat to collect the light and shine it at the chip. So these machines are just mind bogglingly complicated. The laser system alone in this machine, which is actually the easy part of the machine, has 459,000 components in it. Um, no one knows, I've asked, no one knows how many components are in the entire system. Uh, I thought they would know that, they didn't know that. Um, and so each one of these machines costs $150 million a piece. It's the most expensive machine tool in history. Uh, and you can't make an advanced chip without it. Um, and that's just one of the machine tools. You need, others, you need other tools to etch. So once you've deposited your materials, you need to etch small shapes that are actually the transistors. And your etching needs to be basically perfect because you've got if one atom is in the wrong place your canyons that make your transistors are no longer straight so they don't operate the right way and so you've got to etch perfectly straight canyons uh, uh roughly 1 billion uh times on a simple chip and roughly 10 billion times in a complicated chip. um and so this is also a really complicated set of machinery and then you've got to test it to see if it works and testing it means um it's inspected to see if you've done it correctly and so inspecting it means looking at it of course you know it's hard to look at um so you need really complicated machinery to actually you can use a scanning electron microscope to look at it but that's inefficient because it's very very time consuming and so there's complicated tools that give you some sort of variability on visibility on, on seeing it so uh the manufacturing is is wild um and then you actually have to bring these machines together and make chips um and you can't make chips with like 70 percent accuracy because it's too expensive you need 90 something percent accuracy. Um, and that's how the supply chain works. And so the, the tooling companies have been in their positions for 30, 40, 50 years. Um, there's one company that makes each of the key types of tools basically. Um, and uh, no one has ever heard of them, it's kind of shocking. But in fact, we all are desperately dependent on their machines for our daily lives. So break down the geography for us a little bit. What does the US own? What are we good at? What does Europe own? What does Asia own? So the, the US is, uh, is good at the, the software that designs chips, the actual design of chips themselves, which is really hard. Um, and there are certain types of chips where there's one or two companies that has a unique capability to design them. So for example, uh, the, the chips that manage the wireless on and off your phone, just the wireless signal to the, the cell tower. Um, there are basically two companies that can, can do this effectively. And they've got all this specialized knowledge plus a lot of specialized patents that uh, make it really tough to compete with that. So the US has a lot of chip design firms that are very good. Um, most of the machine tools you know, to make chips are made in the US. Um, and then um, the US still produces lots of, um, lots of chips, but increasingly production of chips themselves has moved to other countries. So 10 to 15% of the world's chips are made in the US. Um, Europe produces a fair number of chips still, 10 or 15% as well. Um, but the place where Europe has a chokehold is on lithography machines. There's a Dutch company called ASML, which is the world's only producer of these machines that produces extreme ultraviolet light. Uh, and no one else in world history, I don't think, is going to uh, begin mass production of these machines because they're just so hard to make. Um, it took 30 years of investment to do it. It's just, it's just, uh, it's just too expensive to, to replicate. And then in terms of actual producing chips, uh, 
no U.S. or Japanese, uh, no U.S., Japanese or European companies can do it very well anymore. Uh, in in terms of logic chips, like the processor chips in your phone or your PC, uh, it's Taiwan's TSMC, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Firm, which company which produces ninety percent or so of the most advanced chips, uh, and then Samsung in Korea produces the other ten percent. Um, and so, in each of these steps, there's different countries that have leadership roles, uh, and none of them can do it without the others. In a country you haven't mentioned yet at all but it plays a large role in this book is China, yeah. right? So yeah. you start the book by kind of thinking about a US ship going around Taiwan, worrying about the vulnerability of all of that chip manufacturing. I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about sort of how you view that vulnerability and particularly what timeline you view it on, right? Because I, I read part of this book as saying, this is a, a really big national security threat that nobody's paying attention to or not paying enough attention yeah. to. And I think sort of from the tech side, a lot of people look at Chinese chip manufacturing and say, that's so far away, yep. right? On the, on the timeline where that's a real threat, then all of these tech companies and, and now a lot of government actors as well already have their plans in place to yep. sort of shift their manufacturing. Is it your sense that that's actually sort of a tighter timeline than, than the people in the tech world believe? So I think there's two, there's two ways to think about that question. So one is, is there's this sort of US-China tech race, if you will. Uh, and, I'll deal with that second, but first is just the fact that there's so much production in Taiwan. So if, if there were a China-Taiwan war or a Chinese blockade of Taiwan, you would not be able to buy a smartphone for the next year. And, and but would anybody in China be able to buy a no, smartphone? No, 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 okay. disasters. We, we'd all be totally screwed. Um, so I think that the people in the tech world bank a lot on the idea of like China's not going to destroy its own tech industry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just yeah, that's right. They do. Uh, just like the German government banked a lot on Russia being unwilling to destroy its gas industry. Um, you know, my, um, I, I think that's probably right. Okay. My, I think it's probably right that China won't be willing to destroy its economy for Taiwan. I think my, my estimation of the likelihood that China goes the opposite direction and is willing to roll the dice has increased. And I suppose you've got a four percent chance that China attacks Taiwan in the next decade and put a price tag on that. The expected value is still so enormous, you have to be, spelling, you have to be willing to spend hundreds of billions of dollars if your number is that low. I think that's, that's the interesting part, um, just because the, the dollar value of the global economy would be tremendous. I mean, things you couldn't buy if China attacked Taiwan. Smartphones, just impossible to buy the next year. You wouldn't be able to buy any. Um, PCs, around 40% of just the core chip in a PC, 40% uh, of those are produced in Taiwan data centers, the huge and growing reliance on uh, Taiwan for key chips and data centers. Cars, where well, your car has dozens, not hundreds of chips inside. Most of them are not produced in Taiwan, but you need all of those chips to make your car function as car companies learned uh, to their horror last year. Uh, and the last two years, global chip production increased 8% in 2020 and 12% in 2021. Demand outstripped it. And so there was a $200 billion cost in the auto industry. That's what they increased in chip production. So I think the numbers are so mind bogglingly vast. We haven't even gotten to dishwashers. Your dishwasher needs a chip too. Um, that actually anything other than a light bulb with an on off switch basically has a chip inside. And we, we could not survive uh, without trillions of dollars of cost without Taiwan's chips. If you, if you think about computing power, Taiwan produces one third of the world's new computing power each year. So if you'd like to live in a world in which all that is produced you know, offshore of China in one of the most dangerous hotspots in the world, I, that makes me very nervous. Okay, so you're- Very good, at it. it's not like we can just like move this to the United States. No US company can do it. So why can't we move it to new places, right? That's what the tech companies yep. are looking at right now. As I say, they're looking at it on a you know, five to 10 yeah. year time horizon. But I think that say Apple feels pretty confident that it's going to have a, a much more geographically diverse chip manufacturing set up by then. If they feel confident, I don't think they're right to feel confident. Why not? Well, if you look at, so Apple makes most of its key, all of its key chips, most of its chips on Taiwan right now by TTT. Um, TSMC is building a small facility in Arizona that won't be cutting edge. It's building a facility in Japan, which will be seven generations behind cutting edge. So when you say cutting edge, are we yeah. talking about the chips in my phone? Which chips are we talking yeah, it's cutting about? Edge. So yeah, if you buy a new iPhone, it'll have a cutting edge chip in it. If you buy a new PC, it will have a cutting edge or maybe one or two generations back chip in it. Uh, most importantly, data centers. Okay, um, so we're talking about computers, we're talking about mobile phones. Yeah, and there are other places. I mean, if you buy most 
cars, for example, will generally not have cutting edge chips unless you buy a Tesla. <laughs> and when we say cutting edge, we're talking about the number of transistors on them. Oh, you're talking about the, the number of transistors per area. Okay. Yeah. So this is often described as the number of nanometers. In fact, there's no relation to the number of nanometers and the actual measurements on chips anymore. But um, so today, cutting edge is five nanometers. And then in a couple of years, it'll be three nanometers. Um, the TSMC facility in Taiwan is going to be five nanometers, as far as we know. Um, it's, but it's small, will be upgraded. It's unclear. It, when, it's, when it's online, TSMC in Taiwan will produce three nanometers, which means that I don't think Apple's going to be producing all that much with TSMC in Arizona, where the facility will be, because that will be with second tier, second rate chips. And why can't we build the better chip manufacturers in other places? What's the, what's yeah. the block? I, I mean, I think TSMC could. Okay. <laughs> um, but they, they, don't they got to. the know how and we don't. <laughs> you don't, I don't, no one does. Um, yeah, they don't want it. They don't want it. I think because A, they, they believe justifiably so that they've done something no one else in the world has done or can do. Uh, and so they don't want to screw it up. Fair enough. Um, and then B, they say that it's more cost effective to do it all in one place, which you know might be true, um, plausible. And then C, I think the Taiwanese government also understandably doesn't want industry to move offshore. Also understandable. Um, understandable from their perspective. And so you think even on the 10 year horizon, all of the best chips still gonna be made in Taiwan? I think that's certainly the, gotta be the base case assumption. Okay. If you, if you ask yourself who can plausibly compete with TSMC, Samsung can, um, but when you look at actually processor chips, so Samsung's main business is memory chips, which is a different kind of universe. Processor chips, Samsung's volumes are far lower than TSMC's. They're kind of seen by everyone in the industry as the second source supplier. No one in the industry thinks they're gonna overtake TSMC. And then Intel is the biggest US chip maker of this type of chip. Um, you know, they've got a plan to catch up to TSMC. I will say no one who's not currently paid by Intel believes them. Um, I hope they, I wish them the best, you know, but uh, I, I wouldn't bet on them. Let's talk a little bit about weapons, right? Yeah. When, you, when you think about sort of the announcements this week, the US is gonna start or yeah. add to the, the requirements for chip companies not to sell certain kinds of chips to China. The idea being that there's this link between national security, what you can do with those chips, advanced weapon systems. How good a chip do you need to make what kinds of weapons? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So it's, it's, it's hard really to be sure, actually. Um, we know that weapons are, are very chip intensive. So like the Javelin anti-tank missile will have 200 semiconductors inside, but most of them are really Simple, like you know, dishwasher esque semiconductors. Um, we've got great information over the past six months about what's inside of Russian missiles. So in the US, it's all pretty classified, so you don't really know what's inside US missiles, but now we've gotten teardowns of Russian systems. Um, and they use relatively non advanced things that were cutting edge 10 or 12 years ago um, chips in their systems, largely from the US, South Korea, and Taiwan. Uh, so it's, it's, it's three countries that are providing American electronics for the Russian military. Um, so it's not cutting edge. Um, now, there's a, there's a, a separate question of, um, is it easier to make more advanced systems when you're closer to the cutting edge because your system is in place for five or 10 or 30 years? Um, and so you put the most advanced chip in there you've got. Uh, and so if your, your domestic production is close to the cutting edge, you're gonna put something more advanced in there, possibly. Um, and then I think there's another layer, which is understanding a system design, because it's not just like you got a smart chip and you plug it into your javelin and a tank missile and it flies into the target. You need to understand how all the different chips fit together, how they work with the missile. Um, and that's really complicated and it's not solely a question of the quality of your chips. Um, now all the evidence I think suggests that's hugely important in weapon systems, as I guess you'd, you'd hypothesize because it's hugely important in everything. Um, you know, Apple, Apple's chips, Apple buys the same um, TSMC process as any other co company could buy uh, in terms of how their chips are made, but they do a better job of making phones than their competitors. Um, or we can argue that. And they design their own chips. They well, that's right. And they design their own chips. Um, so they're specifically um, uh, uh, made for, for that. Now, for weapon systems, it's too expensive to design your own chips because they're designing a cutting edge chip costs $200 million. Um, so, you know, the Pentagon's not doing that basically. <laughs> um, because it's, it's just too expensive. The Pentagon can buy a $10 billion aircraft carrier, but they cannot manufacture their own chips, nor increasingly can they design their own chips. Um, so yeah, I think there's, it's certainly not the case that you could say, oh, if China gets this one ship, it's going to have a super weapon. Like that's, that's silly. Um, 
it certainly is the case that there's a really strong correlation um, between the amount of sophistication in, uh, in that's going into um, weapon systems in terms of semiconductors inside. And so it seems a plausible hypothesis that the less access your adversary has to advanced semiconductors and less experience they have in working um, with systems, the harder that they're gonna harder job they're gonna have in designing advanced systems. So is it a good idea? I, I think that we're, we're close to the point where we're we're pushing too far, I think. The United States. Yeah. What's the point where we're pushing too far? How do you sort of conceptualize yeah. that line? So I think I think what you want is a system where your adversaries are fully reliant on your technology. So they don't have an incentive to produce their own. But wouldn't any attempt to restrict what chips we were selling to China create an incentive for them to produce you, their you own? Need a, okay, you need a plausible incentive. So yeah, so if you if you restrict 1% of chip sales to China, 99% of, of Chinese buyers would much prefer to buy from Taiwan using US technology rather than produce in-house, which would be vastly harder. If you restrict 10% of chips to China, uh, there's a growing constituency in China that wants to build their own. If you restrict 100% of chips, then everyone in China is saying we need domestic industry. So there's a, there's a balancing act. Um, we want everyone to be reliant on our technology, both because it means that they help pay for it. Um, so the next generation of semiconductor technology is paid for by the consumers of current day chips. And so you want everyone contributing to that fund. Um, and also you'd rather not have one, anyone else investing on their own because they might get lucky and prove something impressive. And given that China has at this point pretty clearly committed, like this is a, a priority, we're gonna invest heavily in producing our own chips. How should that change the US calculus, should it? So I think that I think it's it's still to be determined what the Chinese are committed clearly to doing. So it's it's evident the Chinese are spending tens of billions of dollars and probably the course of the decade, $100 billion um, in, in its chip industry. There's a, a national level integrated circuit fund um, that is spending in the $50 billion range and then each of the provincial governments plus municipal governments have their own funds. Um, so there's a lot of money going in. If you look at where it's going, I think it's a little bit um, less clear there's a coherent strategy. Um, you know, one of the things I heard throughout my research was that every provincial governor wants a chip fab in his province. And so there's a lot of money going to like third tier uh, chip making facilities in random provinces because so-and-so has got a little bit of money and wants a cool building. Um, so I think there's a fair amount of that going on in China. I think also there are certain places where it's just gonna be really, really hard for China to catch up because it'd be hard for anyone to catch up. Like lithography is I think the best example where there's actually not much evidence that China is actually investing in lithography. Now maybe you'd say, well, they're doing it in secret. Maybe that's true. Although the dollar values involved and the types of specialist materials involved are such that I don't know that it's actually all that plausible to do in secret. And you need to, in order to see if it works, you need to test it in a commercial facility, lots and lots. I think it'd actually be hard to pull off in secret. So I think what we know is China's pouring a lot of money into chip making. We don't know that China's pouring that much money into chip tool making. Uh, design software, I think, to be determined. Um, so it's still a bit of a mixed bag as to what they're actually investing. So I listen to you talk in my senses, and you can tell me if this is unfair, that you're much less worried about sort of China's advances in chip making than perhaps comes across in the book, that sort of at least the timeline is still quite far away. I, I, think, I think that's right. I think, I think there's uncertainty, right? I mean, we, we know that Taiwan went from a tiny role in the chip industry to a major role. Um, we know that Korea did the same thing. We know that Japan did the same thing several decades earlier. So it's clearly not impossible to go from a limited role to a, a, a sizable role. Um, now there's differences. Um, China, Taiwan, and Japan did so in close partnership in many ways with the US, whereas China is doing so in the opposite conditions. Um, but I guess if you ask me, what odds would I put on a East Asian government pouring hundreds of billions of dollars in their ship industry that already is deeply embedded into electronic supply chains, having some successes, I would say you've got to put at least reasonable odds on it. My, my bet would be that in 10 years, China is still hugely reliant on Taiwan, Japan, Korea, and the US for shipping technology in the Netherlands. Um, but I think the odds in that bet aren't like overwhelmingly in one direction. Okay. And so I think there are, is reason to be cognizant that, it, that China could well achieve what Korea's achieved. So you're a little skeptical, it sounds like, of the U.S. approach to limiting chip sales to China. Is that fair? I, I think I think we're approaching the limits of 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 what is what. Like maybe what's going to be announced this week is going to take us over the limit. We'll, we'll see how we'll see how it's scoped. Yeah. yeah. How will you know? How would you assess uh, that? I think it's hard to know. Um, I mean, I think a you need to 
So one of the key questions with export controls is, can you get all of the relevant parties that have access to the technology on board? So for um, cutting edge systems, the number of players is really limited. It's just a couple of firms. For slightly more data than cutting edge, you have some cases where there are two or three firms in multiple countries. And there, you need to make sure you've got everyone on board uh, to cut the Chinese off, if you want to cut the Chinese off. It's still not Chinese companies. It's still Japanese or Korean or whatever. Um, but there's a bit more hurting of allies that needs to be done if you actually want to have effective export controls. And what you really don't want is export controls that just prevent US companies from selling, but let other companies <laughs> sell. That would be the worst case solution. Um, so we're going to have to see how actually the latest round of export controls are crafted uh, and whether they go in that direction. And how about the other US response? The sort of, we're going to pour money into bringing manufacturing here and spend $52 billion on not entirely clear what, but yep. sounds like not a whole lot of fabrication plants because you can't buy very many for that much money. Yeah, it won't be a large number, yeah. What should we be spending that money on? So I, I still think that I, given my expected likelihood, which is not base case, but possibility of a Chinese attack or something that disrupts ship supply, coupled with my expected cost of that, which is in the many trillions, I still think that provides us plenty of justification for spending hundreds of billions of dollars trying to deal with this problem. Now, unless you put a really low number on the probability of Chinese attack, or you, I think, really profoundly underestimate the impact, um, I, I still think we're well within the scope of we ought to be taking more steps to diversify leading edge manufacturing. So, so spend that $52 billion for us. What should it go to? I, I think basically the Commerce Department is doing the right thing. What they're going to do is they're going to subsidize the, the production of a number of fabrication facilities in logic, uh, one in memory, um, and you know, be a small number of facilities, and that'll get you $52 billion. And on what timeline? How fast can we do that? Pretty soon, a couple of years. Okay. And how, how close does that take us to sort of being independent of Taiwanese chips? Not that close, okay. um, closer. And then, you know, Europe's gonna do something of the same, although we're still kind of unclear what the Europeans are gonna do. Um, Japan has been uh, investing in more lagging edge, but nevertheless, capacity is capacity. Singapore has been doing the same. Um, so there are, if you look globally, uh, there is more capacity coming online um, outside of Taiwan. Um, but yeah, we're still gonna be hugely reliant on Taiwan in 10 years time. I think less so, and I think the margin matters. Just as I think, if you're sitting in Germany, You'd have really wished you were you weren't get your you know, even a ten percent reduction in Russian uh, gas reliance would have been meaningful this year. Uh, so too, I think a ten percent reduction in our reliance on chips made in Taiwan would be meaningful. And I think it's worth noting, you know, a lot of the leading edge chips will be produced by a Taiwanese company in the U.S. and that's fine. It's just a question of where it is. How about the other choke points in the supply chain you talk about, right? You you yep. make a fair bit of sort of there's this one company that does lithography. Yep. Should we be worried about that? Should we be trying to spend money there? Or is that just an impossible task? No, I don't think. I mean, it's so A's in the Netherlands, so I guess we I don't worry about them. the Belgians. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think B, um, the way ASML grew is it grew partly by acquiring U.S. firms. And so to make a lithography, a UV lithography scanner today, they're assembled in the Netherlands using key components from Germany with those two key components, one from Connecticut and one from San Diego. Um, so it's a Dutch company, um, but they, those machines don't work without US technology. Um, so the US has a lot of leverage there if it wants to use it. And in reality, the US and Dutch gov governments see more or less eye to eye on the issue. Um, but if that wasn't the case, it's not, the case, it's not that the Dutch government has all the cards in that relationship. Other choke points, the rest of the machine uh, process is choke points. The deposition of uh, layers of material several atoms thick, that's a choke point. The etching of these canyons several atoms thick, that's a choke point. Uh, the inspection uh, is uh, dominated by a small number of firms. Basically, all of the machine tooling is done in the US, Japan, there's one company in the Netherlands, and there's a couple of small players in Israel. And that's it, globally. Um, so there's a lot of different choke points. And, so when we think about manufacturing and tech in China, yeah. right, there are a whole bunch of technologies that we rely on, not just Taiwan, but also China to help manufacture, including smartphones, including a lot of the technologies that require these chips. Yeah. What do you think the difference is between sort of worrying that China could disrupt our chip supply versus worrying that they could much more easily, right, without even moving on Taiwan, disrupt the manufacturing of iPhones yeah. and many other things? Why is this sort of a different industry in that regard? So I think the way to think about it is how hard would it be to establish capabilities that you're cut off from? So 
um, you know, if you're Germany right now, it's going to take two years or three years to really change your energy supply around and get prices back to anywhere where, where they were before. Um, if you wanted to build Taiwan's chip-making capacity offshore, it would take a decade. It would be extraordinarily expensive time consuming. There's been hundreds of billions of dollars of capital investment in Taiwan over the past three decades, all of which is still operational. Uh, you know, if you want to rebuild your capacity to produce one third of the computing power we rely on each year, that's an expensive proposition. Whereas if you wanted to redo you know, the assembly of iPhones, that would be time consuming, but we know we can do it in Vietnam, it's happening. We know we can do it in India, it's happening. Um, so I guess I think it could be done with, with cost differentials, with some delays, but I'm much more confident in our ability to set up alternative assembly facilities than I am to easily set up with alternatives for chipping. So when some of the tech companies do sort of tabletop exercises for this, a big part of what they come up with, and I'm curious if you think this is feasible, is sort of we, we go in there and we fly that machinery out, right? We don't start from scratch. We, if, if there's intelligence that China's going to move on Taiwan as there was that Russia was going to move on Ukraine, we go sort of take that machinery and set it up in Arizona or wherever. Is that feasible or is that not a real? A real I, don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Does it sound feasible? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> like the New York Times says war with Taiwan coming soon. And oh, then, I meant, I meant is it feasible in... to move the, the machinery? Oh, you, you can move the machinery. So, and just to go back to the lithography system. So they're moved in on four 747s mm -hmm. and then assembled in place. So, you know, the amount of time, the amount of advanced notice you would need to remove one of them from Taiwan doesn't sound very feasible. Do you just think we won't have the intelligence in time to? You need the intelligence mm -hmm. months in advance, and then you need to agree to torpedo the Taiwanese economy and your capacity to produce chips because they're not producing chips when they're on the 747 flying around, right? To so, be fair, I don't think the tech companies are concerned about the Taiwanese economy. Well, that's probably right. That's oh. probably right. Uh, but I mean, would, would Taiwan let the machinery leave? Well, no, of course they wouldn't. Um, that's that's their key point of leverage, and you can't blame them for that. And then, okay, let's 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 pause our capacity to produce one third of the world's computing power for six months while we get these machines out of Taiwan. I mean, that's a trillion dollars right there. Six months? You're flying across the world. You have to. You have to. Un I mean, this is the most complicated machinery in the history of the. Like literally, this is the most complicated machinery in the history of the world. The most expensive machine tool in the history of the world. Um, so yeah, I think I think six months is very plausible. All right, I think I've given Chris enough grief. We have a couple microphones set up um, in the aisles if folks have questions. And I know there are some people on Zoom. Go ahead and, and come on down. Oh God, we're broadcasting live. Go ahead. Uh, thanks for doing this. It's definitely a really interesting topic. Um, I've got two questions. One about the materials of microprocessors. Um, do we need to be worried about like a resource competition like we're seeing kind of with um, electric vehicles, like just worry about where those deposits are. Um, where are where are those deposits too, if you know? And then um, you talked a little bit about sort of the national uh, security implications of supply of chips. But I'm kind of curious if you know anything about sort of the national security perspective from an in information perspective. So like there was an article that came out around 2015 that talked about um, potential espionage with chips that were coming from China. I think it was super micro chips um, that were flooded through Amazon data centers and, you know, they shut it down. And um, anyway, I'm curious to know whether, because uh, China might not be the only country that's interested in doing that. So do you know whether there's a TSA or what's, what's our kind of QA, QC when we purchase chips from elsewhere? Because as you said, like the U.S. is not going to be able to make all of its own chips. No. Yeah. So on, on materials, um, you know, I think the key question is not where do the materials come from, but how are they refined to the level of quality that you need? Um, so the, you know, the key material is silicon, which is a sand, so you can get that anywhere, uh, but you need to make it very, very, very pure. Um, I think what we've seen over the past couple of years is that, uh, that we, we need to worry less about materials than we have to worry about tooling. Um, I'll give you one example. Earlier this year, Russia halted the export of neon gas from Russia uh, to the rest of the world with the goal of causing um, supply chain problems for chips because you need neon gas and chips. And except for Russia, the biggest source of production of neon gas before this year was the Azovstal steel plant in Mariupol, which the Russians besieged and then destroyed. So we had like an insane amount of concentration of neon gas production uh, on both sides of the Donbass border. Um, but it didn't matter. 
uh, because actually producing the gas is pretty easy. Any steel facility, my understanding is can do it. Uh, it just is a little bit expensive and environmentally destructive. <laughs> and so as long as you're willing to loosen environmental rules, uh, you can get around it. Um, so I, I think a lot of materials are basically of that nature, like rare earths, same deal. Uh, everyone has rare earths, uh, but they're produced in China because environmental rule regulation. Um, so uh, it, does that mean that you can, if the switch is turned off tomorrow, you can get the materials you want? No, um, but it's a lot easier to refine and produce the chemicals you need, for example, in materials than the rest of the supply chain. Um, on, on verification, you know, I, I think there's a lot of, you, you can find some concern about um, whether the chips you're buying are doing the things you expect them to do or something else. I think uh, the past 30 years suggests it's a lot easier to manipulate software than it is to manipulate hardware. Um, I don't know if Professor Wolf agree with that. But um, I, think that, I think that's what yeah, I think the, I think the story you're referring to, it's the Bloomberg report on here, right? Yeah, I, I would say there's I, I don't want to don't want to go off on that tangent. I think it turns out that the the people who report that story are not as able to stand behind it as we might expect them to have been and that there's not as much evidence of what was going on. There doesn't mean it's impossible. I just think that sort of that as the what at the time felt like it was going to be the big hardware supply chain story of sort of the whole history of cybersecurity turns out to be a little more uncertain and and there are pretty unequivocal denials from apple from the u.s government from everybody who's sort of supposedly involved and affected by it um so i don't i, I don't know what to tell you about that i can't tell you it's absolutely certainly not true but it's certainly not something where the people who go in and try to follow up on that story can can find the same evidence that those original reporters felt that they could there are a couple of examples which appear to be accidents, although one never knows, um, in Intel chips, uh, one called Spectre, one called Meltdown, which allowed passwords to be um, uh, determined from the way the chips were structured. But I, I, I haven't heard anyone really claim that those weren't just accidents. Um, It'd be bad news if Intel were turning on us, for sure. <laughs> I, I meant they might be, <laughs> meant they might be the US government that was involved, but um, hard to know. Um, I, what we do know is that DARPA is putting a ton of money into verification mechanisms. So how do you know that the chip you're buying is going to do what it says it's going to do? Um, that's, they're very public about trying to find ways to, to verify that because they realize that they're going to be dependent on production offshore in various locations for the foreseeable future. Other questions? Uh, thank you very much for today. My name is Do Young. I'm, I'm the second year math student here at the Fletcher. Uh, my question is about the new IRA that has been enacted in the US. So with the new Inflation Reduction Act, there's a rising concerns among the allies and partners um, that the US might not be a really reliable trading partner. So with that in mind, how optimistic are you in the sustainability of the trip alliance among the four countries? Uh, will the partners like Japan and South Korea and Taiwan find the US as a reliable partner to Make the chip alliance sustainable in the long future thank you yeah I think that's a great question and i think it cuts to the um the the sort of poorly thought out or not thought out ways in which supply chain security is discussed in washington because it's sort of the thing that everyone agrees on supply chain security who could disagree uh, <laughs> um and there's phrases like friend shoring which are now popular in washington which i think is also one of the most uh meaningless uh phrases and so in the ira there was a uh, a, a, pop, a, a kind of popularized uh, example of this playing out in action, poorly thought through, uh, the IRA uh, cut out, in particular, Korean firms from supplying electric batteries with uh, batteries electric vehicles with a, a tax discount. And so the Koreans said, well, aren't we your friends? We're the French or <laughs> uh, Biden, I think, I think the Biden administration was sort of embarrassed by it. Uh, but there's a real tension between domestic production and French or, right? These are uh, contradictory. Look, I think it's a balancing act. Um, I think there's obvious uh, drivers in all of the countries we've discussed for domestic production in the US, in Korea, in Taiwan, certainly in China. And everyone would naturally want to be in control of all the technology themselves. Everyone wants to do that. Um, that's just not realistic in the chip industry. There's got to be a division of, um, of labor simply because it's A, the expertise is spread around. B, even if it weren't, it's too capital intensive for one country to plausibly do it on its own. Um, that's just the reality. Um, so I think there is a, a fair amount of bargaining going on right now between the US, Korea, Japan, plus Japan, Taiwan about uh, what does the future shape of the industry look like because all four of those countries are not only watching the market develop but also putting a lot of money into the market that will shape how it develops. Um, I think the reality is that for the past 20 years, 30 years, um, 
Korea and Taiwan have put a lot of money into their chip industry, Japan and the US less so. And that's a key driver for why their share of chip production has increased and the US Japanese share has decreased. If you think about, um, about the costs involved in making a chip, labor costs are really small, it's much expensive machinery. Um, so the key question is tax treatment, actually. Uh, tax treatment is the key differentiating factor between whether you put a fab in Taiwan versus Japan versus uh, versus the US. Uh, and so that's where the Korean and, Jap and, and Taiwanese governments have been very successful. Japanese have been more restrained in recent years for fiscal reasons. And the US has uh, done very little on that front. And that's now what's beginning to change. Hello, uh, Professor, thank you so much for being here. And thank you for writing yet another important book on a very important topic. Um, I have two questions for you. One was about the book writing process itself and one about Russia. Um, was there anything that happened in the last year or in the last two years that really altered the direction of your book or made you want to focus more on one thing versus another thing or kind of change the calculus going forward? And the second question was, you know, as we all know, the Russian economy hasn't been hit as hard as we thought it was going to be hit. Um, but chips, as you laid out clearly here and also as you lay out in your book, are a very important part of any economy in, the, in any country's economy in the world. Given what's happening with Russia right now, and given Russia's access to chips, like to, how how is Russia's access to chips going to change in the future, and how will that affect its economy? Is it going to be drastic? Is it going to be as bad as, bad as we think it's going to be? Is it actually not going to be as bad as we think it's going to be? Given what's been happening since the first sanctions came out, thank you. So, on the same question, if you think of, of Russia, but this is true of most countries, most of the chips consumed in every country, except the ones that produce chips, are consumed inside packaged devices. So, like. Um, most Russian chips are already inside phones or cars or servers or whatever, not like chips coming in the country. So Russian imports of chips are very small uh, because Russia doesn't need that many discrete chips. It needs things that have chips in them like dishwashers. Um, so, so in that sense, actually, Russia is still able to access lots of chips because you can still buy an iPhone or whatever um, in, in Russia. And that was never intended to be impacted. I think what the sanctions will have an impact is on domestic production which is always very small and geared towards the defense industry. Um, we know that Russian domestic production used U.S. Japanese machine tools. Um, you know, we don't know. I don't know now where they're importing their silicon wafers from, but uh, the best silicon wafers are from Germany, Japan, or Taiwan. They're not getting those anymore. Um, so there's a lot of there be a lot of difficulties, I think, in the domestic um, chip production space, which will not have a broader macroeconomic effect because uh, no one was buying from the Russian chip industry in the first place. Uh, other than the Russian military. Will it have an effect there? I think um, almost certainly. Are we going to see it play out in a, a granular sense? No, because it'll be obscured, um, but will be significant, I think, absolutely. We know that in 2014, the U.S. tightened export controls on, um, on the export of radiation-hardened chips to Russia. And you radiation-harden your chips either when you want to send them to space or when you want them to survive some sort of nuclear war, um, so military uses. Uh, and after the U.S. tightened, uh, exports of those ships to Russia in 2014, Russia's space industry faced uh, really substantial delays, which were attributed by Russian officials to the export control. So I think we can say with high confidence that the Russian ship industry, which is economically tiny, uh, will be impacted, but the impact of that will be felt not by the Russian economy aggregate, but by the, by, by the military. Um, on writing the book, well, I think, I think the, the thing that changed you know, when I started this project was about missile technology in the Cold War. And then simultaneous to that, the US and China we're beginning to both focus on chips as a crucial issue in, in domestic and uh, economic policy. Um, and I didn't really realize it when China began its current chip campaign in 2014, which was the key turning point uh, in China's debate. And then in the US, it was really 2017, 2018, when semiconductors began to be used as a tool against China. And, and that's I, putting those two things together um, helped me realize that the chip story was not just something of interest to people uh, who, who were, uh, want to understand Cold War history like myself, but it was a much broader story. And then I think the third thing that came together, which is also not new, but I only realized around 2018 or so, was that if you want to understand the shape of globalization, uh, global supply chains are basically in Asia about semiconductors or goods that would not exist without semiconductors. So China spends more money importing chips than it does importing oil, um, which I was, when I first downloaded that data on Comtrade, <laughs> I read that data about four times to make sure I was understanding right. That's correct. For the past decade, uh, every single year, China spent more money importing chips than oil. Uh, and the rest of Asia is equally reliant on the chip trade. So Taiwan, 40 something percent of exports are chips, basically all of them going to China. Uh, Philippines, 25% of exports are chips. Uh, Malaysia, slightly higher than that. Korea, only 15%. So 
Asia, globalization in Asia is basically a story of semiconductors. Uh, and I had no idea about that when I started the project, but beginning to put those stories next to the missile story is sort of how the book emerged. I don't know if that answers your question. Sir. Hi, thank you for speaking. Um, uh, so I was just wondering where there's value, sometimes there are illegitimate actors who will try to exploit that value. I was wondering if you found that there's a black market or any sort of shady dealings with chips and, and semiconductors in general, or has it been so technical that as a result only legitimized actors can really enter into this space? Um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of shady dealing in finished chips. It's basically impossible to do shady dealing in the production of chips because the money, the dollar values involved and the expertise involved is is orders of magnitude above what a what a uh, any sort of criminal gang could get involved in. Um, so there's there's hardly any uh, any of that in the production of chips because the number of advanced production facilities is so small that they're easy to inspect. Like you, you know exactly where they are, uh, you know exactly what tools they need, you know exactly what software they need, and so the monitoring is almost perfect. There's nothing that's easier to monitor than the chip industry in terms of production. But when it comes to chips themselves, once they're produced, yeah, there's a, there's a big black market. Um, that you can find, and there's lots of anecdotes uh, happening, I think right now, vis-a-vis -vis Russia, but happening in the past as well about countries that weren't supposed to be able to access certain types of chips, smuggling them in. And even in the, the Cold War, this is a big thing. This Soviet uh, consulate in San Francisco was supposed to have 60 agents uh, who were focused on uh, learning about and acquiring technology from Silicon Valley. So there's a long history of, of black markets. Uh, so, yeah, I have three questions. So, first question is like, so people are talking about the possibility of the Chinese blockade against Taiwan these days very often. And but at the same time, if there's a China Chinese blockade in Taiwan Strait, uh, Taiwan would probably probably just like kind of stop any like exporting exportation of chips to China, which will also impact Chinese economy very severely. But have you seen any calculation or estimate estimation about how severe that impact would be and how? Think how long can China kind of sustain this kind of pressure? And the second question would be like, so your so your argument would be like the Chips Act, so like all investment in U.S. is kind of not really sustainable. Like, yeah. So, um, so I I just read a, a an op-ed by the president of Rand Corporation <laughs> yesterday saying like, so uh, if it's not sustainable, why bother investing? What 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 would just like like probably invest like ten percent of the budget to ship more um do more arms um, sales to Taiwan to secure supply chain? Mm -hmm. Just wondering your take on that. Yeah. And third, the third question is like I wanted to write a capstone about this, but after reading your book, I got very frustrated because like you have to, like finish all the topics I wanted to write. So like <laughs> so I just want to. <laughs> This would be I'm an amazing forum to ask him to be your I'm just wondering <laughs> if you have any suggestion or recommendation for anybody in this room who want to do a capstone on this topic. What kind of topics? You want to share. Okay, well, that, that's a hard one. Well, <laughs> uh, let me take the first two. Um, <laughs> So on, on the argument that it's more cost effective to defend Taiwan than to invest in. I mean, I think that's basically true. I think, um, yeah, I, I think if you ask me where would I spend my marginal dollar, I would spend it on giving Taiwan more missiles rather than on building more semiconductors in the US. Um, I don't think that's the trade-off that the US political process gives us, uh, nor is it obviously the trade-off that the Taiwanese political process gives us. Uh, and so I think it's possible to have both. And I'm not sure that spending more on chips in the US is taking money away from giving Taiwan missiles. But I think it's, it's absolutely correct to say that recommitting to the defense of Taiwan and actually doing so credible, right now we do so in a non-credible way. Like Biden occasionally lets slip that he's willing to do it and then his aides deny it the next day. Meanwhile, the US military advantage continues to decline year after year. Like that's the non-credible way to defend Taiwan. Um, so I think if we, had a, we were more credible in it, I think it would um, be a great strategy. Uh, so yeah, I think so Jason Matheny is the guy who wrote this article, the president of the Rand Corporation. I think he's right. Uh, we ought to defend Taiwan for a wide variety of reasons, but this being one of them, uh, and investing more in Taiwan, even if you don't care about Taiwan, if you should, uh, is a great idea because you probably care about your iPhone. Um, and so I think that's a pretty easy argument. Um, what was your first question? Uh, how severe is the impact? Ah, severe, yeah, yeah. You, so this is a really hard economic problem to model out. Um, because it's not just the, the first order of like what's the cost of the chips or even the second order of what's the cost of the goods that chips go into that you lose or China would lose or anyone else would lose. But then there's like third and fourth orders that are actually really important. Um, so, you know, what would the cost be to uh, the slowdown in 
telecoms infrastructure. So right now, the cell phone tower is a piece of metal with a ton of chips in the top. Uh, and today, most of them rely on chip made in Taiwan. Um, so global telephone in infrastructure would freeze uh, in case of a Chinese blockade. Um, so That's the, no. Yeah. What do you mean? When, when all of those towers broke. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, yeah, expansion. Yeah, 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 yeah. expansion. Expansion would freeze, so you'd have no new. But cell like phone we towers. could still make telephones. That's right. That's right. Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. If they broke, you'd have a problem. But yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so you have no new data center build out. Basically, um, you have a bit more flexibility in data centers. But uh, um, but so you'd have all of these kind of knock on effects that are infrastructural, and that would in turn have major economic impacts both in year one and down the road. Um, so I, the the calculation is actually quite complicated. Who would be hurt more? I don't know the answer to that. But I think the important question is who politically can sustain the cost more. Um, the US or China? And that's a question that without any easy or obvious answer, but that is the crucial question. Capstone, there you go. Well, I think, I think, that, I think that is a key question is, is in all these scenarios. So if most of us, uh, for the past decade have just been counting, although the, the, Chinese, the Chinese government says it wants to research control of Taiwan, um, I've, I've been telling ourselves, well, it's not going to do so because it'd be too expensive and economic growth and stuff. Um, and I, I think that's probably still true. Um, but that depends on the calculation of A, does the Chinese government think the US will intervene? Uh, and B, what do they think the differential cost would be to them versus to the rest of the world? Um, and no one knows what they think. Like no one knows what the briefing is lying on Xi Jinping's desk are saying, uh, you know, we now know that the briefings landing at Vladimir Putin's desk in uh, February were deranged, um, like devoid of facts or devoid of the crucial facts um, that led him to a disastrous invasion. I hope she's getting better advice, but I'm not sure about it. Um, and, I, and he might be actually being told that the Chinese political system is more able to sustain economic costs than Western political systems are. And if that's true, then again, a blockade isn't a crazy strategy if you think you're better able to sustain costs. So I, I you know, yeah, I, I worry. I don't worry, you know, 51% chance there's going to be a, a blockade in the next decade. But I think anyone who's mentally pricing in a 2% chance uh, needs to look at the situation a bit more clearly. Um, I one other data point. In 1995-96, when the Taiwanese government was so in the last Taiwan Straits crisis was basically caused by Taiwan, there was independence. Um, and the US sent an aircraft carrier sailing through the Taiwan Straits. You know, that would not happen today. Because everyone is abundantly aware of how dramatically the military balance has shifted. Everyone is abundantly aware of that. We're in a different world, and yet our estimations of the likelihood of war have not adapted. And so I think most of us are like looking at the newspapers about Russia-Ukraine war circa February 15th and saying, well, they're not really going to do it. The gas rate is too profitable. Come on. Go ahead. Professor Chris Miller, um, I, I got a question. And first of all, thank you for your sharing. And just now I'm just checking, the, checking your book. And I saw there's already some Chinese articles and introducing your book. Uh -oh. And the whole bit sells really well. So my question is, uh, this August, Nancy Pelosi visit Taiwan. And one of her very important stop is the TSM, uh, TSMC, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. So I just want to know how do you see this event and how do you think this visit changed the cheap wall and the tensions between China and the US? Thank you. Well, I think the, the core problem that the US faces is that it's, it's politically beneficial and uh, costless for politicians to signal their support for Taiwan via visits, and there's the Taiwan Relations Act in the, in the US, uh, but it's costly to actually do something tangible in terms of spending money. Um, and so we have a, an imbalance of political signaling uh, relative to resources spent, and that's a dangerous place to be. You'd, you'd rather have the resources in place and then start the political signaling rather than start with the political signaling uh, and then hope that the, you know, the next administration will fund the resources you need to sustain them. Uh, so I think it is, we ought to be worried in general, not just Pelosi, but in general about a situation in which, um, yeah, we're now basically, you know, Biden has said now four times that, so the U.S. policy is a bit vague on Taiwan. Biden has now said four times we defend Taiwan if it's act. Uh, 
you know, um, are, we, are we capable of following through? I think everyone knows the answer to the question is a lot less clear than it was 10 years ago. Do we have a strategy for changing that dynamic to make it more clear? I would say we don't. So th that's, that's, the, that's the gap between sort of political posturing and resource allocation that I worry about. All right, we're gonna take one last question, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the insightful discussion. I had a question that uh, recently Quad also secured uh, supply chain for these critical technologies, including 5G. Securing supply chain is another thing, but given the criticality of national security considerations that comes with, as you pointed out in your discussion, what is the scope of uh, co-production of this kind of critical technology, including its design and manufacturing capabilities with your partners who are developing uh, with the alliances or the countries that ally with us and are starting to develop uh, their respective capabilities in different sectors uh, of production of uh, semiconductors thank you yep thank you there's, there's a, a fair amount happening actually via the quad format um, and australia is sort of the 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 country that fits less naturally in here japan has a huge history of, of chip making and tool making and india has more chip designers than any country in the world um, so there's a lot of obvious synergies but then Many of them are working for U.S. firms in India. Uh, so a lot of obvious synergies via the quad between Japan, U.S. and India, Australia, kind of less so. Um, but yeah, there's, there's certainly a lot of focus there. On 5G, you know, I think people hear about 5G and they think of cell phones, but actually you should hear 5G and think about chips because it's the chips that make 5G work. Um, and 5G standards are basically a set of rules that govern how do you write chips being talk to each other. Um, and which is why, you know, for example, the U.S. is able to restrict Huawei's ability to roll out uh, 5G is because the chips you need to get your cell phone to connect to a 5G cell phone network are uh, are, are are designed uh, by U.S. firms and produced largely by um, by TSMC. So uh, 5G is is basically a semiconductor problem, um, which is why there's a fair amount of scope for um, when the Quad has been doing a lot of uh, work around it. Not only 5G, but now people are thinking about the next generation, um, 6G, which will require a whole new set of semiconductors. Excellent. Chris, this is so great. I want to give you a chance just very quickly before we end to say in 30 seconds, 60 seconds, what are the things the US isn't doing that they should be doing around this issue? Are there any? I, I think my biggest takeaway from learning about semiconductor the past five years and you know, starting from basically zero is that we think of tech as a question of people programming things. And I guess that's fine. Um, but actually, it's a question of manufacturing things. It's can you manufacture quintillions of transistors at nanoscopic scale? That's the really hard thing to do. Uh, and that's, I know it's really hard because the companies that are in that space are in that space with monopoly position, monopolistic positions for longer uh, than Google's been in their space with monopoly uh, or than Facebook's been in its space with uh, something approaching monopoly. Uh, and it's the harder thing to copy as well. So. You know, we know multiple countries have set up their own search engines or set up their own e-commerce platforms uh, at basically comparable quality to what you can get through Google or Amazon, or maybe better. How do you measure? Hard to say. Um, it's pretty easy to measure quality of semiconductors. Uh, and we know that production has been dominated by a very small number of countries and companies for a long time. And so I wish we thought more about advanced manufacturing. Um, I find myself thinking a lot more about advanced manufacturing. But it seems to me that that's a source of durable commercial differential and also power differential that I'd never previously been told to think about. So waste less time thinking about the social media companies. Well, that, that is, that is generally that good advice. Thank you for hosting.